We will now have a question and answer session with Mr. Vinod Rai. Those who wish to ask questions, please raise your hands and call for the mics from the attendants. You're requested to announce your name before putting forth your questions. Time available for this question answer will be 10 minutes, only 10 minutes. So please keep your questions very short and we request you not to make long comments. And all questions only from the syllabus. <laughs> all questions only from the syllabus. Sir, audit is very essential, but it is hampering now business decisions. Number of audits which is subjected to business organizations are more than about 50 by different agencies. Can you suggest a single audit system for all the businesses so that they are not wasting their time and energy in unproductive audits also? Would you like to come here? Yes. I, I really couldn't make out when you uh, say that they are subjected to so many audits by... I thought there is an internal audit, there is an external audit. In, uh, there are a number of agencies. There are three professional institutes that are accountants, past accountants, company secretaries, and then there is CBDT tax audit, then service tax audit, VAT audit, and a number of other audits, sir. <laughs> and in addition, you might be aware there is scrutiny audit by income tax department. And recently, limited scrutiny has been converted into complete scrutiny. I can't speak on behalf of the income tax department, of I course. <laughs> I want your guidance as a general policy that government introduces a single system of audit which will take care of all the possibilities with your vast experience as a CAG. Well, I, governments have introduced a large number of single window systems. I don't know whether they'll take the initiative to introduce this kind of a thing in what problem that you point out. But I would sincerely believe the kind of audit of revenues or expenditure is done only by one agency, and that would be the chartered accountant that you engage. Cost accountants and others are engaged for other purposes, not for validation of your balance sheet. And that's the primary role that the audit performs, validates your balance sheet so that it is accepted before your shareholders. So, in a perfect world, with unlimited resources, both manpower and financial, there could be a perfect audit. Every default could be found. Every defaulter could be punished. All money would not be recovered. Part of it would be. Why can we not emphasize further on a preventive audit, something that prevents a thing from done, a pre-audit, as it were, so that the fraud cannot be committed instead of a post-facto audit. Sir, in a perfect role, probably there would be no role for audit. Don't render us unemployed. <clears throat> but see, audit of the kind of audit that is mandated to the CAG, the external auditor, he's an external auditor. He's, by mandate, he is supposed to do an audit which is post-facto the event. But to save from the frauds, as you said, to prevent the frauds, it is the role of internal audit. Internal audit is supposed to be doing it on a concurrent basis and reports directly to the CEO of the setup, of the institution. It's their job to be following this closely and to ensure that such so-called irregularities do not occur. The external auditor will always do post the event and he is not in a position to be able to stop, as you said, a scam or anything occurring. Internal audit function is the one which ensures that. In the corporate world, is there internal audit in government to do preventive there, audit? There is an internal audit system in government. Unfortunately, it's not a very well-structured and strong system, but there is a system in government also. Yeah. 
So I should really thank you for this excellent lecture. When you were answering and reading it, I remembered Mahatma Gandhi and Harish Chandra and Lal Bhattu Shastri. If we have a system where there's absolutely honesty, transparency, probity, it, one, everything is fine. One needs auditors because unfortunately it is not so. You, so you had said that Article 148.4 of the Constitution protects the Comprator General cannot be unseated by, except by process of impeachment. But what guarantees the appointment of an auditor who is absolutely honest to the core and is not a puppet in the hands of the government? That what is the transparency and the faith which we can have in the accounting system and window dressing and uh, the common adage is that an auditor is a watchdog and not a blood dog. But in today's time, the scenario is absolutely different. Could you please highlight on this? I, I don't think it's a very fair assessment of the system as it prevails today. But <clears throat> uh, appointments to these institutions is becoming very transparent today. And I'm sure future Auditors General will also be appointed along the same systems where you have a collegium comprising maybe the Prime Minister, the leader of the opposition and the chief justice who sit together and then make the appointment. It, it is a fairly transparent process and withstands public scrutiny also. By chance, of course, the CAG is not audited by that methodology. We had recommended this about six years back. And I'm sure in the processes to follow, that collegium will be making the sel selection for future CAGs also. Auditor's job is a very difficult job. He has to work like a chartered accountant. He has to work like a lawyer. He has to work like an engineer. He has to work with so many other fair. So how, how, how does the auditor work looking to all these things in, from all angles? See, the auditor also has his specializations. And we have people <clears throat> who are trained in different uh, kinds of roles that you just mentioned. And I, this issue had been uh, raised against us in the Joint Parliamentary Committee when we were auditing exploration of uh, hydrocarbons. Asking, it was the parliamentarians who asked us what is the skill sets that we possess by which we can audit the books of anybody engaged in um, exploring hydrocarbons. You'd be surprised that at that point of time, I don't know what's the position just now, we had 14 of our auditors working in Muscat in their oil authority, doing exactly the work that was the auditors were doing in India. So we have a large number of people who have specialized skill sets, and that's why we can conduct audits of space centers, space programs, maybe defense programs, maybe um, uh, what is it, atomic energy centers, or hydrocarbons, as I mentioned, because these skill sets are acquired, and the institution ensures that these skill sets are honed and trained regularly in best of institutions anywhere around the globe. This is Jairam Motwani here. This is regarding statutory compliances. Considering that there are a plethora of laws and statutes to be complied with, it looks like an ivory curtain sort of that if somebody really actually achieves 100% compliance as an entity. Sir, my question is, have you had an occasion of really releasing a report which has totally 100% clear compliance? <laughs> Uh, a report in government you're talking about? Yeah, in a, whichever entity we take up within the organization or in the setup, considering that we have so many statutory laws and compliances, you know, it might not be what we feel, really speaking, that ironically, you know, we expect that everything should be complied with, but the entity themselves might not be knowing which law will hit. Why do you have a huge pool of professionals whom you pay huge amounts 
if they cannot ensure that all statutory compliances have not been met. Unfortunate, it's very unfortunate that so many statutory compliances or guidelines are put into position. You have to plug all kinds of loopholes. And <clears throat> it is for that that these you know, compliance regime is created. Now, there are a large number of institutions where it is absolutely clear and the institutions is not in default of the regulatory body to which it's supposed to be, which, which, which regulates it. So I don't think it's that much of a difficult phenomenon to be able to comply with all the regulations that are put in place. Thank you. So thank you for that very enlightening uh, talk that you gave us. It was very really nice for another one. I spread a lot in the media about the various matters that you investigated during your tenure as a CA. Uh, the point that you should make is that uh, you were responsible for bringing to the, into the public domain the scams which took place in Tongate, in Juji, uh, in the Commonwealth Games, here in India, and various others. I am not very sure whether the other channel was also under your scrutiny and, and investigated by your new tenure as a CA. Uh, I wish to raise two points here. One is, to the best of one's knowledge, other than certain uh, people getting imprisoned in the uh, Commonwealth Games scam as well as in the Tuki scam. Uh, one is not aware whether these matters have been brought to a conclusion as far as the parliament is concerned and whether the implementation of the reports of the CAG have been effectively done. And secondly, even if that was done, is there any policy or any recommendation that has been put in place or hopefully will be put in place in the future where the losses to the public exchequer and the taxpayers' money can be recouped and re recovered in some manner? Uh, <clears throat> See, as far as the auditor is concerned, the auditor only picks out the irregularities and places them in public domain. Beyond that, it is the role of the investigative agencies. And after the investigative agencies, the judicial process takes over. Unf unfortunately, in India, as you are privy to it, uh, the judicial process takes a huge amount of time. But I think it should be sufficient consolation for all of us that for irregularities committed, irregularities committed not of an act of omission but an act of commission, certain people did have to go to prison. And I would sincerely believe that even if ultimately they are not convicted, the fact that they spent one and a half years in prison is good enough of a deterrence for anybody in future who sits in that high office to ensure that he doesn't commit defaults of the kind that were committed at that point of time. As far as losses are concerned, recouping losses in revenue transactions has been done. We do it, I mean, audit does it on a routine basis, and it's recouped too. But of the kind that have been pointed out in the couple of instances that you indicated, these, that's why we call them, what did we call them? Uh, the losses were called? No. We used a word for them? Presumptive. presumptive. That's it. That's it. Presumptive losses. It just slipped my mind. Okay? Presumptive losses. Because these lo were lo losses not in terms of public exchequer foregone, literally, but in terms of resources which could have been coming into the exchequer in some ways. And to recoup that kind of things is very difficult. I mean, we talk about so much of black money, can we really follow the trail and get it back? So to a large extent, recoupment may not be feasible to the extent that we are able to deter such irregularities for the future. I think the objective would have been achieved. Yeah. Thank you so much. We'd like to give one Big round of applause for the interaction and energy with which Sir has held the question and answer session. And now on behalf of MIDC, Mr. Sanjay Sethi will give a memento to Mr. Vinod Rai.
And on behalf of the Lalit Doshi Memorial Foundation, I request Mrs. Pratima Doshi to present a memento to Mr. Vinod Rai. I now request Mr. Sanjay Sethi, CEO MIDC, to deliver the vote of thanks. I stand here to thank uh, one of the most distinguished uh, civil servants that this country has had. Uh, I guess the word uh, I guess the word bureaucrat is derogatory, sir. Right? <laughs> so, uh, in 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 this country where uh, where we are told that the informal institutions are stronger than the formal institutions. Uh, this is for the man who's contributed to strengthening of the formal institution. Uh, so you have uh, really contributed so much to filling of these institutional voids that we hear about. Uh, we really feel uh, privileged to be a part of this lecture here, uh, a very substantive lecture uh, and presented in a very, very eloquent manner. Thank you so much, sir, for being here. Uh, I also thank uh, Mr. Bharat Doshi, Mr. Pramila Doshi, uh, for keeping this uh, this institution of Bharat Doshi Memorial Lectures live. So a big round of applause for both of them. And uh, Mr. Bongirwar, who uh, has always been a source of inspiration and support for all the young IS officers. Uh, I'm no longer young, but all the, all the young IS officers who come into this uh, cadre uh, look up to him. Uh, he has been associated with this foundation and has been contributing to it. I thank you, sir, for being here and for contributing to this. Uh, and uh, I thank all the members of the audience here for being present in large numbers and uh, for really standing up for this cause. Thank you very much. Before we conclude today's program, on behalf of the trustees of the foundation, I wish to once again thank you, all of you, for joining us today.